1984, a novel, often published as 1984, is a dystopian novel by English novelist George Orwell. It was published in June 1949 by Secker and Warburg as Orwell's ninth and final book completed in his lifetime. The story was mostly written at Barnhill, a farmhouse on the Scottish island of Jura, at times while Orwell suffered from severe tuberculosis. Thematically, 1984 centers on the risks of government overreach, totalitarianism, and repressive regimentation of all persons and behaviors within society. The story takes place in an imagined future, the year 1984, when much of the world has fallen victim to perpetual war, omnipresent government surveillance, historical negationism, and propaganda. Great Britain, known as Airstrip 1, has become a province of a superstate named Oceania that is ruled by the party who employ the thought police to persecute individuality and independent thinking. Big Brother, the leader of the party, enjoys an intense cult of personality despite the fact that he may not even exist. The protagonist, Winston Smith, is a diligent and skillful rank-and-file worker and party member who secretly hates the party and dreams of rebellion. He enters a forbidden relationship with a co-worker, Julia. 1984 has become a classic literary example of political and dystopian fiction. Many terms used in the novel entered common usage, including Big Brother, Doublethink, Thought Crime, Newspeak, Room 101, Telescreen, 2 plus 2 equals 5, Prol, and Memory Hole. 1984 also popularized the adjective, Orwellian, connoting things such as official deception, secret surveillance, brazenly misleading terminology, and manipulation of recorded history by a totalitarian or authoritarian state. Time included it on its 100 Best English Language Novels from 1923 to 2005. It was placed on the Modern Library's 100 Best Novels, reaching number 13 on the editor's list and number 6 on the reader's list. In 2003, the novel was number 8 The Big Read Survey by the BBC. Equals. Topic. History and title Equals Orwell, encapsulate D, the thesis at the heart of his unforgiving novel. In 1944, the implications are dividing the world up into zones of influence, which had been conjured by the Tehran Conference. Three years later, he wrote most of it on the Scottish island of Jura from 1947 to 1948 despite being seriously ill with tuberculosis. On 4 December 1948, he sent the final manuscripts to the publisher Secker and Warburg, and 1984 was published on 8 June 1949. By 1989, it had been translated into 65 languages, more than any other novel in English until then. The title of the novel, its themes, the Newspeak language and the author's surname are often invoked against control and intrusion by the state, and the adjective Orwellian describes a totalitarian dystopia that is characterized by government control and subjugation of the people. Orwell's invented language, Newspeak, satirizes hypocrisy and evasion by the state, the Ministry of Love, Minilove, oversees torture and brainwashing, the Ministry of Plenty, Mini Plenty, oversees shortage and rationing, the Ministry of Peace, Mini Pax, oversees war and atrocity, and the Ministry of Truth, Mini True, oversees propaganda and historical revisionism. The Last Man in Europe was an early title for the novel, but in a letter dated the 22nd of October 1948 to his publisher Frederick Warburg, eight months before publication, Orwell wrote about hesitating between that title and 1984. Warburg suggested choosing the latter, a more commercial choice for the main title. In his 1978 novel 1985, English author Anthony Burgess suggests that Orwell, disillusioned by the onset of the Cold War, 1945 to 91, intended to call the book 1948. The introduction to the Penguin Books Modern Classics edition of 1984 reports that Orwell originally set the novel in 1980 but that he later shifted the date to 1982 and then to 1984. The introduction to the Houghton Mifflin Harcourt edition of Animal Farm and 1984 2003, reports that the title 1984 was chosen simply as an inversion of the year 1948, the year in which it was being completed, and that the date was meant to give an immediacy and urgency to the menace of totalitarian rule. Throughout its publication history, 1984 has been either banned or legally challenged, as subversive or ideologically corrupting, like the dystopian novels We, 1924, by Yevgeny Zamyatin, Brave New World, 1932, by Aldous Huxley, Dark at Noon, 1940, by Arthur Coesler, Calacane, 1940, by Karen Boy and Fahrenheit 451, 1953, by Ray Bradbury. 
Some writers consider the Russian dystopian novel We by Zamyatin to have influenced 1984, and that the novel bears significant similarities in its plot and characters to Darkness at Noon, written years before by Koesela, who was a personal friend of Orwell. The original manuscript for 1984 is significantly the only literary manuscript of Orwell's to survive. It is presently held at the John Hay Library at Brown University. Topic copyright status The novel was first published by Secker and Warburg in the United Kingdom on 8 June 1949 and published by Harcourt, Brace and Company in the United States on 13 June 1949. The usual copyright period within the UK extends to 70 years from the end of the calendar year of the author's death. The usual copyright duration within the US is 95 years from the date of publication, if copyright was renewed during the 28th year following publication. Both the UK and the US are signatories to the Berne Convention and the WIPO Copyright Treaty. Under the Berne Convention, Article 5 4, when a work is published simultaneously in several party countries under Article 3 4, simultaneously, is defined as within 30 days, the country with the shortest term of protection is defined as the country of origin. In the case of 1984, the United Kingdom is considered the country of origin and its copyright period extends until the first day of January following 70 years after the death of the author. George Orwell, the novel's author, died in 1950 so the novel enters the public domain, on 1 January 2021. This same copyright period must be honored by all other parties to the agreement. Topic. Background 1984 is set in Oceania, one of three intercontinental superstates that divided the world after a global war. Smith's memories and his reading of the prescribed book, The Theory and Practice of Oligarchical Collectivism by Emmanuel Goldstein, reveal that after the Second World War, the United Kingdom became involved in a war during the early 1950s in which nuclear weapons destroyed hundreds of cities in Europe, Western Russia and North America. Colchester was destroyed and London also suffered widespread aerial raids, leading Winston's family to take refuge in a London underground station. Britain fell into civil war, with street fighting in London, before the English Socialist Party, abbreviated as INGSOC, emerged victorious and formed a totalitarian government in Britain. The British Commonwealth and Latin America were absorbed by the United States, resulting in the superstate of Oceania. INGSOC became the sole government party in this new nation. Simultaneously, the Soviet Union conquered continental Europe and established the second superstate of Eurasia, under a neo-Bolshevik regime. The third superstate of East Asia emerged in the Far East after another decade of fighting, with a ruling ideology translated from Chinese as death worship or obliteration of the self. The three superstates waged perpetual war for the remaining unconquered lands of the world in a rough quadrilateral with its corners at Tangier, Brazzaville, Darwin, and Hong Kong. Through constantly shifting alliances, although each of the three states is said to have sufficient natural resources, the war continues in order to maintain ideological control over the people. While citizens in each state are trained to despise the ideologies of the other two as uncivilized and barbarous, Goldstein's book, The Theory and Practice of Oligarchical Collectivism, explains that in fact the superstate's ideologies are practically identical and that the public's ignorance of this fact is imperative so that they might continue believing otherwise. The only references to the exterior world for the Oceanian citizenry, the outer party and the proles, are ministry of truth maps and propaganda to ensure their belief in the war. However, due to the fact that Winston barely remembers these events and due to the party's manipulation of historical records, the continuity and accuracy of these events are unclear. Winston himself notes that the party has claimed credit for inventing helicopters, airplanes and trains, while Julia theorizes that the perpetual bombing of London is merely a false flag operation designed to convince the populace that a war is occurring. If the official account was accurate, Smith's strengthening memories and the story of his family's dissolution suggest that the atomic bombings occurred first, followed by civil war featuring confused street fighting in London itself, and the societal post-war reorganization, which the party retrospectively calls the Revolution. Most of the plot takes place in London, the chief city of Airstrip 1, the oceanic province that had once been called England or Britain. Posters of the party leader, Big Brother, bearing the caption, Big Brother is watching you, dominate the city. Winston states it can be found on nearly every house, while the ubiquitous telescreen transceiving television set monitors the private and public lives of the party members. Military parades, propaganda films, and public executions are said to be commonplace. The class hierarchy of Oceania has three levels I, the upper class in a party, the elite ruling minority, who make up 2% of the population. 
2. The middle class outer party, who make up 13% of the population. 3. The lower class proletariat, who make up 85% of the population and represent the uneducated working class. As the government, the party controls the population with four ministries. The Ministry of Peace deals with war and defense. The Ministry of Plenty deals with economic affairs, rationing and starvation. The Ministry of Love deals with law and order, torture and brainwashing. The Ministry of Truth deals with news, entertainment, education and art propaganda. The protagonist, Winston Smith, a member of the Outer Party, works in the records department of the Ministry of Truth as an editor, revising historical records, to make the past conform to the ever-changing party line and deleting references to unpersons, people who have been vaporized, i.e., not only killed by the state but denied existence even in history or memory. The story of Winston Smith begins on 4 April 1984. It was a bright cold day in April, and the clocks were striking 13. Yet he is uncertain of the true date, given the regime's continual rewriting and manipulation of history. Topic. Plot In the year 1984, civilization has been damaged by war, civil conflict, and revolution. Airstrip 1, formerly Britain, is a province of Oceania, one of the three totalitarian superstates that rule the world. It is ruled by the party, under the ideology of Ingsoc, and the mysterious leader Big Brother, who has an intense cult of personality. The party stamps out anyone who does not fully conform to their regime using the thought police and constant surveillance through devices such as telescreens, two-way televisions. Winston Smith is a member of the middle class outer party, working at the Ministry of Truth, where he rewrites historical records to conform to the state's ever changing version of history. Those who fall out of favor with the party become unpersons, disappearing with all evidence of their existence removed. Winston revises past editions of the Times, while the original documents are destroyed by fire in a memory hole. He secretly opposes the party's rule and dreams of rebellion and realizes that he is already a thought criminal and likely to be caught one day. While in a proletarian neighborhood, he meets Mr. Charrington, the owner of an antique shop, and buys a diary. He uses an alcove to hide it from the telescreen in his room, and writes thoughts criticizing the party and Big Brother, and also writes that, if there is hope, it lies in the proles. To his dismay, however, an old man he meets has no significant memory before the revolution. As he works in the Ministry of Truth, he meets Julia, a young woman maintaining the novel writing machines at the ministry, whom Winston suspects of being a spy against him. He also suspects that his superior, an inner party official named O'Brien, is a secret agent for an enigmatic underground resistance movement known as the Brotherhood, a group formed by Big Brother's reviled political rival Emmanuel Goldstein. Smith also has a lunch conversation with Syme, who is writing a dictionary for a revised version of the English language called Newspeak. After Syme admits that the true purpose of Newspeak is to reduce the capacity of human thought, Winston speculates that Syme will disappear as he believes he is too intelligent. He also meets Parsons, his neighbor, whose children are absolutely loyal to the party. One day, Julia secretly hands Winston a note confessing her love for him, and the two begin a torrid affair, an act of the rebellion as the party insists that sex may only be used for reproduction. Winston realizes that she shares his loathing of the party, but later shows that she is not interested in overthrowing the regime, thinking that it is impossible. They first meet in the country, and later in a rented room above Mr. Charrington's shop. During his affair with Julia, Winston remembers the disappearance of his family during the Civil War of the 1950s and his terse relationship with his ex-wife Catherine. He also notices the disappearance of Syme during one of his working days. Weeks later, Winston is approached by O'Brien, who invites Winston over at O'Brien's luxurious flat where both Winston and Julia swear allegiance to the Brotherhood. He sends Winston a copy of the theory and practice of oligarchical collectivism by Emmanuel Goldstein. Meanwhile, during the nation's hate week, Oceania's enemy suddenly changes from Eurasia to East Asia and Winston is called back to make changes to the records to conform to the nation's new allegiance and enemy. Winston and Julia read parts of the book, which explains more about how the party maintains power, the true meanings of its slogans and the concept of perpetual war. It argues that the party can be overthrown if proles proletarians rise up against it. However, to Smith, it does not answer why the party maintains power. Soon, Mr. Charrington is revealed to be an agent of the Thought Police and Winston and Julia are captured and imprisoned in the Ministry of Love. Smith briefly meets his other colleagues who have been arrested for other charges. O'Brien reveals that he is actually an agent as well and was simply part of a special sting operation to catch Thought criminals. Over many months, Winston is tortured and forced to cure himself of his insanity. 
by changing his own perception to fit the party line. O'Brien openly admits that the party is not interested in the good of others, it is interested solely in power. He says that once Winston is brainwashed into loyalty, he will be released back into society for a period of time, before they execute him. When he asks Winston if there is anything worse that can happen, Winston points out that the party has not managed to make him betray Julia, and that while he accepts the party's doctrines, he still hates Big Brother. O'Brien then takes Winston to room 101 for the final stage of re-education. The room contains each prisoner's worst fear, in Winston's case, rats. As a wire cage holding hungry rats is fitted onto his face, Winston eventually betrays Julia. After being released, Winston meets Julia in a park. She says that she was also tortured, and both reveal betraying the other. Later, Winston sits alone in a cafe as Oceania celebrates a supposed victory over Eurasian armies in Africa and realizes that he loved Big Brother. Topic. Characters Topic. Main characters Winston Smith, the protagonist who is a phlegmatic everyman and is curious of the past before the revolution. Julia, Winston's lover who is a covert, rebel from the waist downwards, who publicly espouses party doctrine as a member of the fanatical junior anti-sex league. O'Brien, a member of the inner party who poses as a member of the Brotherhood, the counter-revolutionary resistance, in order to deceive, trap, and capture Winston and Julia. O'Brien has a servant named Martin. Topic. Secondary characters Aronson, Jones, and Rutherford, former members of the inner party whom Winston vaguely remembers as among the original leaders of the revolution, long before he had heard of Big Brother. They confessed to treasonable conspiracies with foreign powers and were then executed in the political purges of the 1960s. In between their confessions and executions, Winston saw them drinking in the Chestnut Tree Café, with broken noses, suggesting that their confessions had been obtained by torture. Later, in the course of his editorial work, Winston sees newspaper evidence contradicting their confessions, but drops it into a memory hole. Eleven years later, he is confronted with the same photograph during his interrogation. Ample Forth, Winston's one-time records department colleague who was imprisoned for leaving the word God in a Kipling poem as he could not find another rhyme for Rod. Winston encounters him at the middle of Ample Forth is a dreamer and intellectual who takes pleasure in his work, and respects poetry and language, traits which cause him disfavor with the party. Charrington, an officer of the Thought Police posing as a sympathetic antique stealer amongst the proles. Catherine Smith, the emotionally indifferent wife whom Winston can't get rid of. Despite disliking sexual intercourse, Catherine married Winston because it was their duty to the party. Although she was a good thinkful ideologue, they separated because the couple could not conceive children. Divorce is not permitted, but couples who cannot have children may live separately. For much of the story Winston lives in vague hope that Catherine may die or could be got rid of, so that he may marry Julia. He regrets not having killed her by pushing her over the edge of a quarry when he had the chance many years previously. Tom Parsons, Winston's naive neighbor, and an ideal member of the outer party, an uneducated, suggestible man who is utterly loyal to the party, and fully believes in its perfect image. He is socially active and participates in the party activities for his social class. He is friendly towards Smith, and despite his political conformity punishes his bullying son for firing a catapult at Winston. Later, as a prisoner, Winston sees Parsons is in the Ministry of Love, as his daughter had reported him to the Thought Police, saying she heard him speak against Big Brother in his sleep. Even this does not dampen his belief in the party, and he states he could do good work in the hard labor camps. Mrs. Parsons, Parsons's wife is a wan and hapless woman who is intimidated by her own children. The Parsons children, members of the Party Youth League, representing the new generation of Oceanian citizens, without memory of life before Big Brother, and without family ties or emotional sentiment, the model society envisioned by the inner party. Syme, Winston's colleague at the Ministry of Truth. He was a lexicographer who helped develop the language and the dictionary of Newspeak. Although he is enthusiastic about his work and support for the party, Winston notes that he is too intelligent. He sees too clearly and speaks too plainly. Winston predicts, correctly, that Syme will become an umperson. Topic. Unseen characters Whether these characters are real or fabrications of party propaganda is something that neither Winston nor the reader is permitted to know. 
Big Brother, the leader and figurehead of the party that rules Oceania. Emmanuel Goldstein, ostensibly a former leading figure in the party who became the counter-revolutionary leader of the Brotherhood, and author of the book, The Theory and Practice of Oligarchical Collectivism. Goldstein is the symbolic enemy of the state. The national nemesis who ideologically unites the people of Oceania with the party, especially during the two minutes hate and other fearmongering. Topic. World in novel Topic. Ingsoc Ingsoc English socialism, is the predominant ideology and shooter philosophy of Oceania, and Newspeak is the official language of official documents. Orwell depicts the party's ideology as an oligarchical worldview that rejects and vilifies every principle for which the socialist movement originally stood, and it does so in the name of socialism. Topic. Ministries of Oceania In London, the capital city of Airstrip 1, Oceania's four government ministries are in pyramids, 300 metres high, the facades of which display the party's three slogans. The ministry's names are the opposite double think of their true functions, the Ministry of Peace concerns itself with war, the Ministry of Truth with lies, the Ministry of Love with torture and the Ministry of Plenty with starvation. Part 2, Chapter 9, The Theory and Practice of Oligarchical Collectivism Topic. Ministry of Peace The Ministry of Peace supports Oceania's perpetual war against either of the two other superstates. The primary aim of modern warfare, in accordance with the principles of doubler think, this aim is simultaneously recognized and not recognized by the directing brains of the inner party, is to use up the products of the machine without raising the general standard of living. Ever since the end of the 19th century, the problem of what to do with the surplus of consumption goods has been latent in industrial society. At present, when few human beings even have enough to eat, this problem is obviously not urgent, and it might not have become so, even if no artificial processes of destruction had been at work. Topic. Ministry of Plenty the Ministry of Plenty rations and controls food, goods, and domestic production. Every fiscal quarter, it publishes false claims of having raised the standard of living, when it has, in fact, reduced rations, availability, and production. The Ministry of Truth substantiates the Ministry of Plenty's claims by revising historical records to report numbers supporting the current increased rations. Topic: Ministry of Truth. The Ministry of Truth controls information, news, entertainment, education, and the arts. Winston Smith works in the Mini True Dep Records Department, rectifying historical records to concord with Big Brother's current pronouncements so that everything the party says is true. Topic: Ministry of Love. The Ministry of Love identifies, monitors, arrests, and converts real and imagined dissidents. In Winston's experience, the dissident is beaten and tortured, and, when near broken, he is sent to room 101 to face the worst thing in the world, until love for Big Brother and the party replaces dissension. Topic. Double think The key word here is black-white. Like so many newspeak words, this word has two mutually contradictory meanings. Applied to an opponent, it means the habit of impudently claiming that black is white, in contradiction of the plain facts. Applied to a party member, it means a loyal willingness to say that black is white when party discipline demands this. But it means also the ability to believe that black is white, and more, to know that black is white, and to forget that one has ever believed the contrary. This demands a continuous alteration of the past, made possible by the system of thought which really embraces all the rest, and which is known in newspeak as doublethink. Double think is basically the power of holding two contradictory beliefs in one's mind simultaneously, and accepting both of them. Topic. Political geography Three perpetually warring totalitarian super-states control the world Oceania ideology, Ingsoc, i.e. English socialism, whose core territories are the Western Hemisphere, the British Isles, Australasia, Polynesia and Southern Africa Eurasia ideology, neo-Bolshevism, whose core territories are continental Europe and Russia, including Siberia 
East Asia ideology, obliteration of the self or death worship, whose core territories are China, Japan, Korea and Indochina. The perpetual war is fought for control of the disputed area lying between the frontiers of the super states, which forms a rough parallelogram with its corners at Tangier, Brazzaville, Darwin and Hong Kong. In northern Africa, the Middle East, India and Indonesia are where the superstates capture and use slave labor. Fighting also takes place between Eurasia and East Asia in Manchuria, Mongolia and Central Asia, and all three powers battle one another over various Atlantic and Pacific islands. Topic. The Revolution Winston Smith's memory and Emmanuel Goldstein's book communicate some of the history that precipitated the revolution. Eurasia was formed when the Soviet Union conquered continental Europe, creating a single state stretching from Portugal to the Bering Strait. Eurasia does not include the British Isles because the United States annexed them along with the rest of the British Empire and Latin America, thus establishing Oceania and gaining control over a quarter of the planet. East Asia, the last superstate established, emerged only after a decade of confused fighting. It includes the Asian lands conquered by China and Japan. Although East Asia is prevented from matching Eurasia's size, its larger populace compensates for that handicap. The annexation of Britain occurred about the same time as the atomic war that provoked civil war, but who fought whom in the war is left unclear. Nuclear weapons fell on Britain, and atomic bombing of Colchester is referenced in the text. Exactly how Insoc and its rival systems, Neo-Bolshevism and Death Worship, gained power in their respective countries is also unclear. While the precise chronology cannot be traced, most of the global societal reorganization occurred between 1945 and the early 1960s. Winston and Julia once meet in the ruins of a church that was destroyed in a nuclear attack 30 years earlier, which suggests 1954 as the year of the atomic war that destabilized society and allowed the party to seize power. It is stated in the novel that the fourth quarter of 1983 was also the sixth quarter of the ninth three-year plan which implies that the first quarter of the first three-year plan began in July 1958. By then, the party was apparently in control of Oceania. Topic. The war In 1984, there is a perpetual war between Oceania, Eurasia and East Asia, the superstates that emerged from the global atomic war. The theory and practice of oligarchical collectivism, by Emmanuel Goldstein, explains that each state is so strong it cannot be defeated, even with the combined forces of two superstates, despite changing alliances. To hide such contradictions, history is rewritten to explain that the new alliance always was so, the populaces are accustomed to doublethink and accept it. The war is not fought in Oceanian, Eurasian or East Asian territory but in the Arctic wastes and in a disputed zone comprising the sea and land from Tangiers, Northern Africa, to Darwin, Australia. At the start, Oceania and East Asia are allies fighting Eurasia in northern Africa and the Malabar coast. That alliance ends in Oceania, allied with Eurasia, fights East Asia, a change occurring on Hate Week, dedicated to creating patriotic fervor for the party's perpetual war. The public are blind to the change, in mid-sentence, an orator changes the name of the enemy from Eurasia to East Asia. Without pause, when the public are enraged at noticing that the wrong flags and posters are displayed, they tear them down. The party later claims to have captured the whole of Africa. Goldstein's book explains that the purpose of the unwinnable, perpetual war is to consume human labor and commodities so that the economy of a superstate cannot support economic equality, with a high standard of life for every citizen. By using up most of the produced objects like boots and rations, the proles are kept poor and uneducated and will neither realize what the government is doing nor rebel. Goldstein also details an Oceanian strategy of attacking enemy cities with atomic rockets before invasion but dismisses it as unfeasible and contrary to the war's purpose. Despite the atomic bombing of cities in the 1950s, the superstate stopped it for fear that would imbalance the powers. The military technology in the novel differs little from that of World War II, but strategic bomber aeroplanes are replaced with rocket bombs, helicopters were heavily used as weapons of war, they did not figure in World War II in any form but prototypes, and surface combat units have been all but replaced by immense and unsinkable floating fortresses, island-like contraptions concentrating the firepower of a whole naval task force in a single, semi-mobile platform. In the novel, one is said to have been anchored between Iceland and the Faroe Islands, suggesting a preference for sea lane interdiction and denial. Topic. Living standards The Society of Airstrip 1 and, according to the book, 
Almost the whole world, lives in poverty, hunger, disease and filth are the norms. Ruined cities and towns are common, the consequence of the civil war, the atomic wars and the purportedly enemy but possibly false flag rockets. Social decay and wrecked buildings surround Winston. Aside from the ministerial pyramids, little of London was rebuilt. Members of the outer party consume synthetic foodstuffs and poor quality luxuries, such as oily gin and loosely packed cigarettes, distributed under the Victory brand. That is a parody of the low quality Indian made Victory cigarettes, widely smoked in Britain and by British soldiers during World War II. They were smoked because it was easier to import them from India than it was to import American cigarettes from across the Atlantic because of the War of the Atlantic. Winston describes something as simple as the repair of a broken pane of glass as requiring committee approval that can take several years and so most of those living in one of the blocks usually do the repairs themselves. Winston himself is called in by Mrs. Parsons to repair her blocked sink. All outer party residences include telescreens that serve both as outlets for propaganda and to monitor the party members, they can be turned down, but they cannot be turned off. In contrast to their subordinates, the inner party upper class of Oceanian society reside in clean and comfortable flats in their own quarter of the city, with pantries well stocked with foodstuffs such as wine, coffee and sugar, all denied to the general populace. Winston is astonished that the lifts in O'Brien's building work, the telescreens can be switched off and O'Brien has an Asian men servant, Martin. All members of the inner party are attended to by slaves captured in the disputed zone, and the book suggests that many have their own motorcars or even helicopters. Nonetheless, the book makes clear that even the conditions enjoyed by the inner party are only relatively comfortable, and standards would be regarded as austere by those of the pre revolutionary elite. The proles live in poverty and are kept sedated with alcohol, pornography, and a national lottery whose winnings are never actually paid out, that is obscured by propaganda and the lack of communication within Oceania. At the same time, the proles are freer and less intimidated than the middle class outer party, they are subject to certain levels of monitoring but are not expected to be particularly patriotic. They lack telescreens in their own homes and often jeer at the telescreens that they see. The book indicates that is because the middle class, not the lower class, traditionally starts revolutions. The model demands tight control of the middle class, with ambitious outer party members neutralized by a promotion to the inner party or reintegration by the Ministry of Love, and proles can be allowed intellectual freedom because they lack intellect. Winston nonetheless believes that, "...the future belonged to the proles. The standard of living of the populace is low overall. Consumer goods are scarce, and all those available through official channels are of low quality. For instance, despite the party regularly reporting increased boot production, more than half of the Oceanian populace goes barefoot. The party claims that poverty is a necessary sacrifice for the war effort, and, "...the book." confirms that to be partially correct since the purpose of perpetual war consumes surplus industrial production. Outer party members and proles occasionally gain access to better items in the market, which deals in goods that were pilfered from the residences of the inner party. Topic. Themes Topic. Nationalism. 1984 expands upon the subjects summarized in Orwell's essay, Notes on Nationalism, about the lack of vocabulary needed to explain the unrecognized phenomena behind certain political forces. In 1984, the party's artificial, minimalist language, Newspeak, addresses the matter. Positive nationalism, Oceanian's perpetual love for Big Brother, Neo-Toryism and Celtic nationalism are, as Orwell argues, defined by love. Negative nationalism, Oceanian's perpetual hatred for Emmanuel Goldstein, Stalinism and Anglophobia are, as Orwell argues, defined by hatred. Transferred nationalism, Oceania's enemy changes, and an orator changes mid-sentence. The crowd instantly transfers its hatred to the new enemy. Transferred nationalism swiftly redirects emotions from one power unit to another, for example, communism, pacifism, color feeling and class feeling. It happens during Hate Week, a party rally against the original enemy. The crowd goes wild and destroys the posters that are now against their new friend, and many say that they must be the act of an agent of their new enemy and former friend. Many of the crowd must have put up the posters before the rally but think that the state of affairs had always been the case. O'Brien concludes, the object of persecution is persecution. The object of torture is torture. The object of power is power. Topic. Futurology. In the book, Inner Party member O'Brien describes the party's vision of the future, there will be no curiosity, no enjoyment of the process of life. 
all competing pleasures will be destroyed. But always, do not forget this, Winston, always there will be the intoxication of power, constantly increasing and constantly growing subtler. Always, at every moment, there will be the thrill of victory, the sensation of trampling on an enemy who is helpless. If you want a picture of the future, imagine a boot stamping on a human face, forever. Topic. Censorship A major theme of 1984 is censorship, especially in the Ministry of Truth, where photographs are modified and public archives rewritten to rid them of unpersons, persons who are erased from history by the party. On the telescreens, figures for all types of production are grossly exaggerated or simply invented to indicate an ever-growing economy, when the reality is the opposite. One small example of the endless censorship is Winston being charged with the task of eliminating a reference to an unperson in a newspaper article. He proceeds to write an article about Comrade Ogilvy, a made-up party member who displayed great heroism by leaping into the sea from a helicopter so that the dispatches he was carrying would not fall into enemy hands. Topic. Surveillance The inhabitants of Oceania, particularly the outer party members, have no real privacy. Many of them live in apartments equipped with two-way telescreens so that they may be watched or listened to at any time. Similar telescreens are found at workstations and in public places, along with hidden microphones. Written correspondence is routinely opened and read by the government before it is delivered. The thought police employ undercover agents, who pose as normal citizens and report any person with subversive tendencies. Children are encouraged to report suspicious persons to the government, and some denounce their parents. Citizens are controlled, and the smallest sign of rebellion, even something so small as a facial expression, can result in immediate arrest and imprisonment. Thus, citizens, particularly party members, are compelled to obedience. Topic. Newspeak Appendix The Principles of Newspeak is an academic essay appended to the novel. It describes the development of Newspeak, the party's minimalist artificial language meant to ideologically align thought and action with the principles of Ingsoc by making all other modes of thought impossible. The idea that the structure of language can be used to influence thought is known as linguistic relativity. Whether or not the Newspeak appendix implies a hopeful end to 1984 remains a critical debate, as it is in standard English and refers to Newspeak, Ingsoc, the party etc., in the past tense. Relative to our own, the Newspeak vocabulary was tiny, and new ways of reducing it were constantly being devised. p. 422. Some critics Atwood, Benstead, Milner, Pynchon, claim that for the essay's author, both Newspeak and the totalitarian government are in the past. Topic. Sources for literary motifs 1984 uses themes from life in the Soviet Union and wartime life in Great Britain as sources for many of its motifs. Some time at an unspecified date after the first American publication of the book, producer Sidney Sheldon wrote to Orwell interested in adapting the novel to the Broadway stage. Orwell sold the American stage rights to Sheldon, explaining that his basic goal with 1984 was imagining the consequences of Stalinist government ruling British society. 1984 was based chiefly on communism, because that is the dominant form of totalitarianism, but I was trying chiefly to imagine what communism would be like if it were firmly rooted in the English-speaking countries, and was no longer a mere extension of the Russian Foreign Office. The statement, 2 plus 2 equals 5 used to torment Winston Smith during his interrogation, was a Communist Party slogan from the second five-year plan, which encouraged fulfillment of the five-year plan in four years. The slogan was seen in electric lights on Moscow house fronts, billboards and elsewhere, the switch of Oceania's allegiance from East Asia to Eurasia and the subsequent rewriting of history. Oceania was at war with East Asia. Oceania had always been at war with East Asia. A large part of the political literature of five years was now completely obsolete. CH9 is evocative of the Soviet Union's changing relations with Nazi Germany. The two nations were open and frequently vehement critics of each other until the signing of the 1939 Treaty of Non-Aggression. Thereafter, and continuing until the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941, no criticism of Germany was allowed in the Soviet press, and all references to prior party lines stopped—including in the majority of non-Russian communist parties who tended to follow the Russian line. Orwell had criticized the Communist Party of Great Britain for supporting the treaty in his essays for Betrayal of the Left 1941. 
The Hitler–Stalin Pact of August 1939 reversed the Soviet Union's stated foreign policy. It was too much for many of the fellow travelers like Gollinch Orwell's sometime publisher who had put their faith in a strategy of construction popular front governments and the peace bloc between Russia, Britain and France. The description of Emanuel Goldstein, with a «small, goatee beard», evokes the image of Leon Trotsky. The film of Goldstein during the two minutes hate is described as showing him being transformed into a bleeding sheep. This image was used in a propaganda film during the Kino I period of Soviet film, which showed Trotsky transforming into a goat. Goldstein's book is similar to Trotsky's highly critical analysis of the USSR, The Revolution Betrayed, published in 1936. The omnipresent images of Big Brother, a man described as having a mustache, bears resemblance to the cult of personality built up around Joseph Stalin. The news in Oceania emphasized production figures, just as it did in the Soviet Union, where record setting in factories by Heroes of Socialist Labor was especially glorified. The best known of these was Alexei Stakhanov, who purportedly set a record for coal mining in 1935. The tortures of the Ministry of Love evoked the procedures used by the NKVD in their interrogations, including the use of rubber truncheons, being forbidden to put your hands in your pockets, remaining in brightly lit rooms for days, torture through the use of their greatest fear, and the victim being shown a mirror after their physical collapse. The random bombing of Airstrip 1 is based on the buzz bombs and the V-2 rocket, which struck England at random in 1944-1945. The Thought Police is based on the NKVD, which arrested people for random, anti-Soviet, remarks. The Thought Crime motif is drawn from Kempitai, the Japanese wartime secret police, who arrested people for unpatriotic thoughts. The confessions of the Thought Criminals Rutherford, Aronson and Jones are based on the show trials of the 1930s, which included fabricated confessions by prominent Bolsheviks Nikolai Bukharin, Grigory Zinoviev and Lev Kamenev to the effect that they were being paid by the Nazi government to undermine the Soviet regime under Leon Trotsky's direction. The song, Under the Spreading Chestnut Tree, Under the Spreading Chestnut Tree, I Sold You, and You Sold Me, was based on an old English song called, Go No More A Rushing. Under the spreading chestnut tree, where I knelt upon my knee, we were as happy as could be, neath the spreading chestnut tree." The song was published as early as 1891. The song was a popular camp song in the 1920s, sung with corresponding movements like touching one's chest when singing, chest, and touching one's head when singing, nut. Glenn Miller recorded the song in 1939, the hates. Two Minutes Hate and Hate Week were inspired by the constant rallies sponsored by party organs throughout the Stalinist period. These were often short pep talks given to workers before their shifts began two minutes hate, but could also last for days, as in the annual celebrations of the anniversary of the October Revolution hate week. Orwell fictionalized, Newspeak, Doublethink, and Ministry of Truth, as evinced by both the Soviet press and that of Nazi Germany. In particular, he adapted Soviet ideological discourse constructed to ensure that public statements could not be questioned. Winston Smith's job, Revising History and the «unperson» motif are based on the Stalinist habit of airbrushing images of «fallen» people from group photographs and removing references to them in books and newspapers. In one well-known example, the Soviet encyclopedia had an article about Lavronti Baraya. When he fell in 1953, and was subsequently executed, institutes that had the encyclopedia were sent an article about the Bering Strait, with instructions to paste it over the article about Baraya, Big Brothers, «Orders of the Day» were inspired by Stalin's regular wartime orders, called by the same name. A small collection of the more political of these have been published together with his wartime speeches in English as On the Great Patriotic War of the Soviet Union by Joseph Stalin. Like Big Brother's orders of the day, Stalin's frequently lauded heroic individuals, like Comrade Ogilvy, the fictitious hero Winston Smith invented to rectify, fabricate a Big Brother order of the day. The Ingsoc slogan, Our New, Happy Life repeated from telescreens, evokes Stalin's 1935 statement, which became a CPSU slogan, "'Life has become better, comrades, life has become more cheerful'". In 1940, Argentine writer Jorge Luis Borges published, "'Talon, Eukbar, Orbis Tertius'", which describes the invention by a "'benevolent secret society' of a world that would seek to remake human language and reality along human-invented lines. The story concludes with an appendix describing the success of the project. Borges' story addresses similar themes of epistemology, language and history to 1984. 
Influences During World War II, Orwell believed that British democracy as it existed before 1939 would not survive the war. The question being, would it end via fascist coup d'état from above or via socialist revolution from below? Later, he admitted that events proved him wrong. What really matters is that I fell into the trap of assuming that the war and the revolution are inseparable. 1984, 1949, and Animal Farm, 1945, share themes of the betrayed revolution, the person's subordination to the collective, rigorously enforced class distinctions, inner party, outer party, proles, the cult of personality, concentration camps, thought police, compulsory regimented daily exercise, and youth leagues. Oceania resulted from the U.S. annexation of the British Empire to counter the Asian peril to Australia and New Zealand. It is a naval power whose militarism venerates the sailors of the floating fortresses, from which battle is given to recapturing India, the jewel in the crown of the British Empire. Much of Oceanic society is based upon the USSR under Joseph Stalin, Big Brother. The televised two minutes hate is ritual demonization of the enemies of the state, especially Emmanuel Goldstein, viz. Leon Trotsky. Altered photographs and newspaper articles create unpersons deleted from the national historical record, including even founding members of the regime, Jones, Aronson and Rutherford, in the 1960s purges, viz. the Soviet purges of the 1930s, in which leaders of the Bolshevik Revolution were similarly treated. A similar thing also happened during the French Revolution in which many of the original leaders of the revolution were later put to death, for example Danton who was put to death by Robespierre, and then later Robespierre himself met the same fate. In his 1946 essay, Why I Write, Orwell explains that the serious works he wrote since the Spanish Civil War 1936 were written, directly or indirectly, against totalitarianism and for democratic socialism. 1984 is a cautionary tale about revolution betrayed by totalitarian defenders previously proposed in homage to Catalonia 1938 and Animal Farm 1945, while Coming Up for Air 1939 celebrates the personal and political freedoms lost in 1984-1949. Biographer Michael Sheldon notes Orwell's Edwardian childhood at Henley-on-Thames as the Golden Country, being bullied at St. Cyprian's School as his empathy with victims, his life in the Indian Imperial Police in Burma and the techniques of violence and censorship in the BBC as capricious authority. Other influences include Darkness at Noon 1940 and The Yogi and the Commissar 1945 by Arthur Coesler, The Iron Heel 1908 by Jack London 1920, Dips into the Near Future by John A. Hobson, Brave New World 1932 by Aldous Huxley, We 1921 by Yevgeny Zamyatin which he reviewed in 1946 and The Managerial Revolution 1940 by James Burnham predicting perpetual war among three totalitarian Superstates. Orwell told Jacintha Buddycom that he would write a novel stylistically like a modern utopia 1905 by H. G. Wells, extrapolating from World War II. The novel's pastiche parallels the politics and rhetoric at war's end the changed alliances at the Cold Wars. 1945–91, beginning, the Ministry of Truth derives from the BBC's overseas service, controlled by the Ministry of Information, Room 101 derives from a conference room at BBC Broadcasting House, the Senate House of the University of London, containing the Ministry of Information is the architectural inspiration for the Minitru, the post-war decrepitude derives from the socio-political life of the UK and the US, i.e. The impoverished Britain of 1948 losing its empire despite newspaper reported imperial triumph, and war ally but peacetime foe, Soviet Russia became Eurasia. The term, English socialism, has precedence in his wartime writings. In the essay, The Lion and the Unicorn Socialism and the English Genius, 1941, he said that, The war and the revolution are inseparable. The fact that we are at war has turned socialism from a textbook word into a realizable policy. Because Britain's superannuated social class system hindered the war effort and only a socialist economy would defeat Adolf Hitler. Given the middle classes grasping this, they too would abide socialist revolution and that only reactionary Britons would oppose it, thus limiting the force revolutionaries would need to take power. An English socialism would come about which will never lose touch with the tradition of compromise and the belief in a law that is above the state. It will shoot traitors, but it will give them a solemn trial beforehand and occasionally it will acquit them. It will crush any open revolt promptly and cruelly, but it will interfere very little with the spoken and written word. In the world of 1984, English socialism, or Ingsoc, in Newspeak is a totalitarian ideology unlike the English Revolution he foresaw. Comparison of the wartime essay, The Lion and the Unicorn, 
With 1984 shows that he perceived a Big Brother regime as a perversion of his cherished socialist ideals and English socialism. Thus Oceania is a corruption of the British Empire he believed would evolve into a federation of socialist states, like a looser and freer version of the Union of Soviet Republics. Topic. Critical reception When it was first published, 1984 received critical acclaim. V. S. Pritchett, reviewing the novel for The New Statesman stated, I do not think I have ever read a novel more frightening and depressing, and yet, such are the originality, the suspense, the speed of writing and withering indignation that it is impossible to put the book down. P. H. Newby, reviewing 1984 for The Listener magazine, described it as the most arresting political novel written by an Englishman since Rex Warner's The Aerodrome. 1984 was also praised by Bertrand Russell, E. M. Forster and Harold Nicholson. On the other hand, Edward Shanks, reviewing 1984 for the Sunday Times, was dismissive. Shanks claimed 1984, "...breaks all records for gloomy vaticination." C. S. Lewis was also critical of the novel, claiming that the relationship of Julia and Winston, and especially the party's view on sex, lacked credibility, and that the setting was odious rather than tragic. In other media 1984 has been adapted for the cinema, radio, television and theatre at least twice each, as well as for other art media, such as ballet and opera. Topic Cultural impact The effect of 1984 on the English language is extensive. The concepts of Big Brother, Room 101, The Thought Police, Thought Crime, Unperson, Memory Hole, Oblivion, Double Think, Simultaneously Holding and Believing Contradictory Beliefs, and Newspeak, Ideological Language, have become common phrases for denoting totalitarian authority. Double speak and group think are both deliberate elaborations of double think, and the adjective Orwellian means similar to Orwell's writings, especially 1984. The practice of ending words with speak, such as media speak, is drawn from the novel. Orwell is perpetually associated with 1984. In July 1984, an asteroid was discovered by Antonin Mrkos and named after Orwell. In 1955, an episode of The Goon Show, 1985, was broadcast, written by Spike Milligan and Eric Sykes and based on Nigel Neal's television adaptation. It was re recorded about a month later with the same script but a slightly different cast. 1985 parodies many of the main scenes in Orwell's novel. In 1970, the American rock group Spirit released the song, 1984, based on Orwell's novel. In 1974, David Bowie released the album Diamond Dogs. It is thought to be loosely based on the novel 1984. It includes the tracks, We Are the Dead, 1984, and Big Brother. Before the album was made, Bowie's management Mainman, had planned for Bowie and Tony Ingrassia, Mainman's creative consultant, to co-write and direct a musical production of Orwell's 1984, but Orwell's widow refused to give Mainman the rights. In 1977, the British rock band The Jam released the album This Is The Modern World, which includes the track, Standards by Paul Weller. This track concludes with the lyrics, Dot and ignorance is strength, we have God on our side, look, you know what happened to Winston. In 1984, the British music duo Eurythmics released 1984, For the Love of Big Brother, a soundtrack album containing music recorded for director Michael Radford's 1984 film 1984, based on George Orwell's dystopian novel. Virgin Films produced the film for release in its namesake year, and commissioned Eurythmics to write a soundtrack. In 1984, Apple Computer made a Super Bowl advertisement for the Mac, which stated, 1984 won't be like, 1984. The ad was suggesting that the Apple Mac would be freedom from Big Brother, the IBM PC. In 1984, Love is, Suicide by Ian Williams and the 1984 Project. Love is, Suicide was recorded by Ian Williams and the 1984 Project at Trident Studios in Soho, London, in January 1984. The dance track was co-produced by Firecra Trench and Ian Williams of Big Bang. An episode of Doctor Who, called The God Complex, depicts an alien ship disguised as a hotel containing room 101 like spaces, and quotes the nursery rhyme as well. In 2007, the song Welcome to 1984 by the American punk rock band Anti Flag was released on the Punk Goes Acoustic Volume 2 compilation. In September 2009, the English progressive rock band Muse released The Resistance, which included songs influenced by 1984. In 2012, the movie Cloud Atlas depicts a dark, dystopian future where a global world government is in power. A captured political prisoner is interrogated by a government official and warned not to use Korean, referred to as subspeak. 
Similarly in the book, English is no longer in use having been diluted into newspeak, an ideological language designed to support the party line, curtailing illegal thoughts and even preventing their formation. In September 2017, the Argentine music quintet, Ministerio del AMA, edited his conceptual album, Selfie Postmortem, based on this novel. In 1966 Frank Zappa's song Who Are the Brain Police? is according to Zappa is a song of religious theme. However it may also seem to be inspired by Orwell's 1984 Thought Police. References to the themes, concepts and plot of 1984 have appeared frequently in other works, especially in popular music and video entertainment. An example is the worldwide hit reality television show Big Brother, in which a group of people live together in a large house, isolated from the outside world but continuously watched by television cameras. In November 2011, the U.S. government argued before the U.S. Supreme Court that it wants to continue utilizing GPS tracking of individuals without first seeking a warrant. In response, Justice Stephen Breyer questioned what that means for a democratic society by referencing 1984. Justice Breyer asked, If you win this case, then there is nothing to prevent the police or the government from monitoring 24 hours a day the public movement of every citizen of the United States. So if you win, you suddenly produce what sounds like 1984. The book touches on the invasion of privacy and ubiquitous surveillance. From mid-2013 it was publicized that the NSA has been secretly monitoring and storing global Internet traffic, including the bulk data collection of email and phone call data. Sales of 1984 increased by up to seven times within the first week of the 2013 mass surveillance leaks. The book again topped the Amazon.com sales charts in 2017 after a controversy involving Kellyanne Conway using the phrase, alternative facts, to explain discrepancies with the media. The book also shows mass media as a catalyst for the intensification of destructive emotions and violence. Since the 20th century, news and other forms of media have been publicizing violence more often. In 2013, Nottingham Playhouse, the Almeida Theatre and Headlong staged a successful new adaptation by Robert Icker and Duncan Macmillan, which twice toured the UK and played an extended run in London's West End. The play opened on Broadway in 2017. Topic. Brave New World Comparisons In the decades since the publication of 1984, there have been numerous comparisons to Aldous Huxley's novel Brave New World, which had been published 17 years earlier, in 1932. They are both predictions of societies dominated by a central government and are both based on extensions of the trends of their times. However, members of the ruling class of 1984 used brutal force, torture and mind control to keep individuals in line, while rulers in Brave New World keep the citizens in line by addictive drugs and pleasurable distractions. In October 1949, after reading 1984, Huxley sent a letter to Orwell and wrote that it would be more efficient for rulers to stay in power by the softer touch by allowing citizens to self-seek pleasure to control them rather than brute force and to allow a false sense of freedom. Within the next generation I believe that the world's rulers will discover that infant conditioning and narco-hypnosis are more efficient, as instruments of government, than clubs and prisons, and that the lust for power can be just as completely satisfied by suggesting people into loving their servitude as by flogging and kicking them into obedience. Elements of both novels can be seen in modern-day societies, with Huxley's vision being more dominant in the West and Orwell's vision more prevalent with dictators in ex-communist countries, as is pointed out in essays that compare the two novels, including Huxley's own Brave New World Revisited, comparisons with other dystopian novels like The Handmaid's Tale, Virtual Light, The Private Eye and The Children of Men have also been drawn. See also